One of the really exciting areas for Pinot Noir in Australia is Mornington Peninsula. Now this is a little peninsula just south of Melbourne, so heavily influenced by the Southern Ocean breezes. We know Pinot Noir likes that, but rather than have me explain it to you, I'm waiting for my friend Martin Spedding from 10 Minutes by Tractor, and he's just moments away. Oh, here he is now. G'day Martin. G'day mate, how are you going? <laughs> Good. Welcome. Thank you. Let's get the goods on Mornington. Get down to the vineyards. Okay, Shall I good. jump on the back here? Yeah, why not? Let's Beauty. do that. Maybe a new tractor would make it in 10 minutes, maybe. Oh, that was 17, so you have to change the name. But. It was a little slow, wasn't it? But uh, anyway, <laughs> we got here. It, we made it, and it's a beautiful place. So the excitement about Pinot in Mornington is understandable. I'm, I'm a huge fan, and I love it. But why is Mornington so good? I mean, I can see the ocean here. We know that's yeah. a, a key factor. So Well, basically, Mark, you've got this lovely, cool climate, and you've got the moderating influence of the ocean coming right up into this valley, and it, as it is across the peninsula. So we're getting this long and slow growing uh, season with flavour being able to build slowly over the course of seasons. So that slow ripening gives you all that flavour, all that character. And something like Pinot, which is so responsive to those sorts of the conditions, it means you're getting a wine which has got you know, great personality. A little bit of a challenge to grow, it do you it's find? A, it's, a finicky, it's a finicky grape, they call it the heartbreak grape. You've got to keep the yield very low so that you're getting lots of concentration of flavour. What strikes me about Mornington is that you don't see a lot of really big, vast expanses of vineyard land. It's all little pockets, in fact, it's hard to get a sense of Mornington. So clearly there's got to be a lot of, you know, a lot of single vineyards and that's pretty much what your philosophy it is. is isn't it? it is. I mean, Mornington's sort of this undulating sort of landscape, you know, rolling down to the ocean on one side, down to the bay on the other. And you've got these little valleys and little nooks and crannies where the vineyards have been planted. And they're all incredibly different in terms of the style of the wine that we can produce from them. And I suppose it's that exp exploration of the terroir and the individual character of those sites that we're really looking for. And so the single vineyard wines are basically giving a unique character to this place and this site. Yeah, so wine that's speaking of its place as Exa opposed to it's just its grape variety. Exactly, rather than a blend of, of wines from many different places which gives you a varietal character. What you're getting here is the true character that comes through and this vineyard is remarkably different from our other vineyard, say the McCutcheon vineyard, which is only 10 minutes away. And that's the case all over the peninsula. So it's this ongoing discovery of really working out which are the best sites and which sites are producing what sort of characters. And uh, with something as expressive as Pinot, you're getting that, that uh, clear communication of that through the wine. So let's, uh, let's go test that single vineyard theory out and go try some wine. What do you reckon? Let's do that.
When it comes to picking stemware these days, you're faced with all sorts of choices. There are glasses that have been designed to capture the nuance and character of virtually every major grape variety and wine style. So whether it be a champagne flute or a glass for Sauvignon Blanc and Riesling, Pinot Noir and Burgundy styles, Bordeaux and Cabernet blends, these are worth it. They're meticulously crafted. But if you're like me and spend most of your money on wine, you're gonna want something just like this one here. It feels great when you pick it up, Nice thin rim so it feels good when you taste the wine. It's got the classic tulip shape, which captures all the aroma and the essence of the wine. So for every day, all purpose, this one's the ticket. Martin was kind enough to invite me for lunch and I was kind enough to invite Bill Downey, who I was having a beer with last night, to lunch as well. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> Not at all. Bill's an old friend. Good. <laughs> um, one thing we didn't address, but uh, you made a good point earlier. When you think of Australia, most people do not even think of Pinot Noir. It doesn't even come into the discussion. Most people don't even know who yeah. grow it. Yeah. When I travel internationally, people are shocked when I say, well, hey, when it, for the whole winter, when I look out my front window, the hills opposite my house are covered in snow. Like yeah. that, I think that's understandable. I think the rest of the world is starting to discover those different parts of Australia and one great way of doing that of course is through the wines that are produced in these areas and um, a very small number of places in the world where Pinot Noir does really well, it has the right conditions and um, there's a very strong fraternity if you like. Uh, People will start to fully appreciate what's, what's possible in this part of the world. I'm just seeing some food oh, coming. Through. Here's the, uh, the spicy oh, duck beautiful. for you, Mark. Fantastic. Some Tasmanian salmon. And, uh, and we've also got some barramundi here, oh, which is a great Australian place. fish. I think one of the things is there are real, really no rules when it comes to food and wine matching. I think <laughs> yeah. uh, you've really got to work it out for yourself and see what works. Experimentation's the name of the game, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm a little bit um, tired of talking. Okay. <laughs> I'm tasting this, actually. The restaurant gives us an opportunity to sort of for people to explore the food and wine matching, which I think is so much in, uh, so much part of enjoying great wine. Such a miserable life you guys live. <laughs> you got surfing down the road here, you grow know, beautiful abundance of fantastic fresh fish, and, and, and we're very lucky. Yeah, very, very lucky. lucky. That's all. Yeah, Some so weeks we even get to work as little as a hundred hours. <laughs> That's <laughs> Pinot Noir is not exactly something people uh, immediately think of when they think of Australian wine, but uh, it seems to be hitting its stride. Yeah, look, I, th I think our vines are getting um, some, some good maturity and we're starting to understand the land that we cultivate. And I think, you know, some, having some older vines and really understanding what, what the flavours are we're trying to extract from our own, you know, piece of dirt is really important. So, you know, I do, I, I'm one of these people that feels fairly strongly that, that um, it, it's about it's about nuance of, of variety, but it's more about the flavour of the place. Yeah. Speaking of which, you're, we're here in Yarra, so what is, the, in your sort of summing up, what would be the flavour of Yarra 
difficult because I'm sure there's different sections. Yeah, sure. We're, we're very aromatic here. We, we, we have really lovely perfume in Pinot Noir. Uh, we make sort of fairly light, elegant styles of Pinot Noir. And, um, uh, and it is, you know, it's quite different to other regions. You know, Mornington are uh, uh, certainly a lot fuller, perhaps a little less perfume. Um, and uh, some of the other sort of areas around sort of Melbourne have their own sort of unique flavours. But I think, you know, Yarra is, is very sort of delicate in the flavour, you know, spectrum of, of, of Pinot Noir. Yeah. No, I like it. I, I agree with it. There's a beautiful, nice floral lift to this. And uh, working for so long as I did as a sommelier, I loved Pinot Noirs of this sort of uh, calibre. They're so flexible and then this whole sort of fascination with wine and food pairing. It covers all the bases. You've got a table of four that comes up with a you know, chicken, scallop or, or you know, all sorts of different yeah. dishes. It may not be perfect with everything, but it'll go with everything as opposed to, say, Cabernet, which can be a little bit tricky with certain, uh, certain dishes. But uh, very flexible and um, texture and, and aroma, beautiful stuff. So I'm in the Tricentenary Grenache Vineyard in the Barossa Valley with Brian Walsh from Yolumba and uh, we're going to discuss the old vine Grenache in Barossa. So what is it about uh, Grenache that's sort of a little bit puzzling to people? It's not like anyone just sort of walks in and says I'll have a bottle of Grenache, uh, yet these vines have been in the ground for well over a hundred years and you've got all this history and heritage but nobody, no one seems to sort of know it as well as they probably should. Good question, Mark. Um, Grenache is, in my view, one of the great great varieties of, of this region uh, and the world, but it has been a bit of an underdog for a long time. It's sort of been um, one of those varieties which has been a bit of a workhorse, a bit of a rollick the sleeves type of <laughs> type of wine, right. with not quite the um, accolades of the, of the classics, the Pinots and the Cabernets and the Chardonnays of the world. But it's now shown, after growing in this region for over 120 years, that it's got the goods to deliver. Tricentenary is a bit of a cheeky name, don't you think? Well, the vines are not 300 years old, but um, Tricentenary refers to the fact that these vines were planted in the 19th century and are still bearing fruit and making great wine in the 21st century. So that's our uh, little take, but we think it's still pretty special in the new world to have uh, vines of such age, oh, still creating great grapes. That's fantastic. Mm. So I, love the, um, I love the perfume of the variety. It's, uh, it's spice and aromatics um, on the nose in particular. The palate I always think savoury. I think um, I want something to eat after I have a glass of Grenache. It's a really great uh, wine for anything with a bit of grill or a bit of char. We can taste a grape now if you yeah, like. Yeah, sure, great idea. Let's have a look at some of these. So these are still maybe a week or two away from, uh, from harvest, but um, not a, Grenache is typically a large grape, but they're not terribly large. Um, so we'd expect a high concentration of flavour and uh, texture and some lovely tannins in that wine as well. Is a small berry size a function of old vines? Or just the vintage or? A bit of both. Yeah. These vines um, are, are almost self-limiting. They've been here so long, we don't do too much work. They look after themselves pretty well, and it, as does the winemaking to some extent. And what do you mean by that, that winemaking takes care of itself? It's not a... Well, we don't... don't to... There's no oak used. Um, it's a fairly traditional fermentation, um, and we don't add any yeast. We just use a very non-interventionist process and allow the sort of terroir, to influ the influence that has on the grape development and the flavour to do all the work. So it's pretty much hands-off winemaking. We feel really, really bad taking a salary for it, really. <laughs> I'll mention that to your <laughs> boss, but... OK, speaking of terroir, we've discussed it a lot um, in the past. What is... I mean, I can see a lot of sand here. The thing about this thing, Nard, is that the roots go down a long way. They've been here a long time. Right. They're not going to get much nutrient out of the top sandy level, but they get their roots down maybe 15, 20 feet, and they're picking up, obviously, mineral characters out of the... Um, um, out of the lower soil profiles. Oh, right. When you're thinking about uh, Grenache and food, what sort of things are you thinking? Because it's a fairly rich wine, or how would you describe the body of most Grenache? Well, it's, yeah, it's at once, it is at once um, 
rich but also with a fragrance about it. It's not, it's not a heavy wine, you know, it's not those sort of wines that are all sort of uh, gutsy with rich extract and tannin. They have a more, a more fragrant aromatic, uh, aromatic character to them. So I think they go with a whole array of um, food styles. I particularly like them with a grill. You know, whether that's grilled chicken or grilled lamb or, or whatever, it doesn't really matter. But I think they really go well with that sort of freshly um, char-grilled uh, meat. That said, they can also go with a more rustic food style, which could be, say, some sort of you know, local stew and so on. In fact, I think Grenache is really a rustic wine style compared to maybe the more prestigious styles that we might see from other grape varieties, the so-called noble grape varieties. <laughs> One of our locals here calls it the hot area Pinot, and I think ah, it is okay. a bit like that. We need a hot climate to grow good Grenache, we need a cold, a cold climate to make good Pinot. So it's a really, it's a reverse equation. But by the same token, we would think, um, without being disparaging to others, that Grenache is generally reliable wine to, to purchase, even though there's sometimes a little bit of reluctance for people to take that first step and buy it. Uh, we think that um, it's a fairly risk-free uh, purchasing decision because the wines are so consistently good if they're coming from vines that have been around for 120 or 100 or even 50 or 60 years. Yeah, it's fantastic to have this heritage and it's nice to know that you really don't do much with them, I guess. <laughs> That's right. So they yeah. just take care of themselves. Yeah, nature seems to well, look after these wines pretty well. So the whole old vine discussion is an interesting one. You see it on bottles, but what does it actually really mean? So Mike, is an old vine sort of really producing fruit that's of higher quality, or what's your, oh, absolutely, what's your take? Absolutely, without doubt. I think that the essential part of old vine is, is purely yeah, the, the age, the maturity, the balance that they achieve that young vine material just can't get. So when you're drinking or growing old vine material, they have there's a lot more character there and that character is built naturally and obviously it, it, it comes from the soil up. The fact that you know we're taught we're dealing with 80 to 100 year old vines in our region is, is quite extraordinary and one of the I think one of the amazing varieties that we grow in this region is Grenache. Um, it, it hasn't been talked enough about, it hasn't been drunk enough and I think we have a fantastic opportunity right here you know today to be able to put old vine Grenache into bottle to educate people about it, to show them, okay, why is old vine so fantastic? And and the answer really is in in the soil, yeah. and the fact that they 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 mature slower. They're, it's like a mature individual, you know. At 20, you're going to go out and do a lot of things you wouldn't do at 40 and 60, <laughs> you know. So I think, yeah, at 60 and 80 year old, these old the girls and boys, they just they find their balance. They they can survive extremes in heat. They can survive cold temperatures, and they. Yeah, they find a balance which I think, you know, look, the proof is in how fantastic these bunches look. You know, mm. it's like, okay, so we're going towards the end of our season and these are in great nick and still, you know, showing beautiful natural colour, bloom, etc. And, and that that flavour, we're still two weeks away from picking this variety, but, you know, it's, it's building its intensity, but it doesn't get rushed into having to achieve something really quickly. It finds its balance naturally and, yeah, it uh, speaks for itself, I think. And McLaren Vale is just flush with all this fantastic old vine material and it's so good that they've hung on to it because there was a period of time in the history of, of, of Grenache mm. where it was kind of relegated to port production, wasn't it? It, totally. was, it wasn't, wasn't really table wine yeah. material, but yeah. it's and, so nice to have that material. In the, in the 40s and 50s, that's all that was being made was, was, you know, from the old vine material was fortified. Then we had the eight, in the 80s, there was the vine pool and majority of people, so the government actually paid people money to go through and pull vines out because they thought there was an excess. 
unfortunately a lot of those vines that got pulled out were these 80 and 100 year old vines at that stage. The, the, the I suppose the hardcore growers, right, what they did is they came together and said, hang on a minute, you know, this is, some, this is our heritage, right? And fortunately for us, our generation, they've hung on to those old vines, right? And now we're being able to make wines out of this magnificent material. What really people should be aware of is the fact that even if you're paying one or two, maybe even three or four dollars extra for, for a bottle of old vine Grenache mm -hmm. from McLaren Vale, yep. you're coming, you're getting this wine from yep, exactly. like unbelievable you're, plant you're, material. You're getting the opportunity to walk into some amazing heritage. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, and I think, yeah, look, I agree. You know, if it costs you an extra couple of bucks, it's actually worth it because you know the the heritage, the the site of where this has come from, the fact that you know they. They're achieving a balance at their age it is quite extraordinary. And I think one of the one of the key points about McLaren Vale Grenache that sets it apart from from the rest of the world that produces Grenache is purely where we're standing. You know, the old vines is is what sets it apart. And you get this the flavour profile and I mean Grenache can be made into rose. Right? And majority of that comes off young vines. You're not going to make rose out of these wines, you know, no. these vines, because you're going to make something that's full bodied very, very serious wine, and some of the oldest Grenaches I've actually tasted, or some of the oldest wines I've tasted from this region have been Grenache, right? So they sell it beautifully, and we just don't understand enough about them, and um, I suppose that's our job, to educate people and say, okay, well look, this is off 80 and 100 year old vines, yeah, it's going to sell it beautifully, and the flavours are extraordinary. So that's the message, get out, drink more McLaren Vale uh, Grenache, eh? That's it. Absolutely. Good stuff. Silky, seductive and charming, my love affair with Pinot Noir continues and now I have a new fascination, the cool climate styles of Mornington Peninsula and Yarra Valley. And how about Grenache? Barossa Valley and McLaren Vale are loaded with century old vines and if there's a better value taste of history in the wine world, I'd like to see it. This stuff is so bloody delicious you really can make an argument for it being Pinot Noir's cousin if you like. Now arm yourself with a couple of bottles of each, fire up the barbecue, invite a few friends over and show them how hip you really are.